Okay, hello and good morning everybody. And I would also like to welcome everyone here in Budapest today. Uh, my name is Istvan Pushpei. I'm a member of uh, K-Monitor, organizer of today's event. Today's event, um, not all members are pictured above, including myself, which is reasonable since I joined the organization about six weeks ago. <laughs> And uh, now let me talk about our decade and a half long experience of fighting corruption. Um, so K-Monitor is fundamentally a watchdog for public funds. Um, fighting corruption and promoting the transparency of public spending. Uh, our core activities include, uh, for example, uh, operating open data websites, uh, filing uh, freedom of information requests, um, advocating for policy change, also recently, we have been busy with the EU's conditionality mechanism. And in the past five years, the organization had multiple projects on the local level cooperating with, uh, with municipalities. I, I shall ta talk about some of these projects later on. So everybody here knows about our little backsliding, democratic backsliding problem, and that it has already explained um, a lot of it. So I'm not going to go into detail about, about how it in, uh, impacts local governance. I would just like to amend what she said with two data points. Um, the municipalities share in uh, the total public spending has decreased uh, from 23% to 13% um, over the past 12 years. And in terms of uh, public investment, the share dropped from 60 to 25%. Uh, this is just to so show you the scope of, uh, of the centralization efforts of uh, Fides. Uh, in terms of how this backsliding looks in practice um, on the local level, uh, I brought you a few examples uh, to talk about just very briefly. So, uh, Fides uh, decided to bundle together you know, the European parliamentary elections and municipal elections uh, due in 2024 which poses a serious dilemma for the opposition, uh, since the opposition owes most of its electoral success in 2019 to uh, supporting common candidates. So in 2024, uh, they either uh, decide to run on a common platform again, which makes absolutely no sense for the European parliamentary elections, or they run separately and risk losing the few um, valuable positions that they have won in 2019. Another example is uh, how over the summer, out of the blue, the government uh, took over asset management uh, rights to several public uh, squares in Budapest and have given them uh, to the fifth district municipality, which is uh, one of the few Fidesz-led municipalities in Budapest. Um, here in the picture, you can see Vörös Marki Square uh, with the annual Christmas market. Incidentally, on the bottom right corner, uh, there's a large uh, real estate development project of the um, son-in-law of our prime minister. Um, and the third example is how the government has found an, uh, several ways to override uh, local spatial planning regulations over the past 12 years. One of these uh, methods is uh, to, uh, to announce uh, that certain projects have a special significance to the national economy, uh, which means they don't have to have any regard for the lo local uh, building code, for example. This example here is from the 14th district, um, where this uh, real estate development project is set to include a thousand flats, uh, a mall, and some office buildings, and it also endangers a legendary local marketplace. Also, they are allowed to build twice as tall buildings than which would be set in the local building code. So these are just a few examples of like how it looks like from the bottom up uh, in practice. Now to talk about uh, the COVID crisis and the energy crisis, more recent energy crisis, just very briefly, since Edith has already mentioned some of the um, 
measures that the government has taken uh, to further centralize and consolidate its power over the local level. But it's been somewhat of a roller coaster from the perspective of local civil society and uh, municipal relations. Uh, since, on the one hand, uh, as I mentioned, the government has um, increased its efforts uh, to centralize by cutting uh, tax revenues of municipalities, increasing the solidarity tax, um, and also uh, providing uh, compensation in a very politically biased manner. Uh, so this severely limits local autonomy and democracy. However, on the other hand, um, opposition-led governments have been more open to um, civil society input and to progressive agendas since, well, they are, they are under pressure to deliver, even without resources. And generally, these uh, progressive and civil society organizations tend to uh, uh, put forth more creative and cheap solutions. Uh, basically, they can outsource some of the work. But there is also this issue, which uh, Edith has mentioned, that um, well, uh, she talked about part of it, how affecting policy change in such an environment is very difficult, uh, partially because of these informal linkages and because people do not feel that they can uh, make a meaningful impact. And also just because municipalities are, are in a terrible financial uh, condition currently. Which leads me to um, one of my last points. Um, in the framework of our current project, uh, we are looking at asset management practices of uh, municipalities. This is actually one of the last few ad policy areas where uh, municipalities still have a level of autonomy. And, but it also brings with it a very real threat that uh, bigger cities and districts in Budapest, which still have um, substantial assets uh, in their possession, um, will liquidate these assets uh, in response to the financial situation. So what we do is, uh, first part of our project is policy research uh, where we try to understand the systemic pressures uh, uh, incentivizing the privatization of these public assets and we try to advocate for a change in logic and decision making uh, which would result hopefully in the municipalities not selling these assets but instead keeping them utilizing them um, uh, for the longer term the second pillar is um, amending and expanding our uh, program called the uh, is the bare minimum, uh, which is basically a checklist of transparency measures uh, that we advocate for municipalities to, uh, to implement. And then later on, we conduct an audit uh, and announce the winners uh, to have a little bit of a positive um, incentive. And we are expanding this list with some audit, uh, with uh, with some asset management um, uh, measures. Um, just to mention a few of our other uh, municipality-related projects, um, this is uh, this map shows um, it's a crowd-sourced uh, uh, map, and it shows places which are closing due to the energy crisis. Uh, you can see municipality institutions represented in blue, uh, which is, well, to provide a little bit of context, um, the overhead, overhead uh, cost reduction program, uh, which included previously the municipalities, uh, well, municipalities were excluded from this program during the summer, which meant that uh, from, um, from one day to the next, uh, the overhead, co overhead uh, costs of municipalities uh, could rise with uh, 15 to 20 folds. Um, so this puts municipalities in a very difficult position and often uh, the solution is to consolidate some of their uh, public services or institutions and close down uh, museums, theaters, um, sport halls or uh, swimming pools, for example. So you can see uh, some of this. And we collected this information through uh, PartyMap, uh, which is our own uh, 
open source uh, geo survey tool, um, which will be available in English soon. Uh, and this is another uh, open source data visualization uh, tool which helps municipalities uh, explain their budgets to the general public. There are already uh, around 15 municipalities which use it. These are just a few examples of our um, projects and also with regards to civil society and municipality relations, our previous projects uh, project dealt with uh, uh, such corporations and you can find the lessons learned on a link that was already in the in the slides, uh, localgov.kmonitor.hu. So thank you very much for your attention and I'm looking forward to uh, fruitful discussions today. And a very good morning on my behalf as well. I'm Elena from Funky Citizens. Um, well, as an organization, we do many things. I won't bother with everything, though I like to brag about it all the time. Uh, I'm just going to focus on what we're doing um, at local level or working with sometimes municipalities or struggling to work with municipalities. Uh, we focus mainly on three areas, local budgets, public procurement, and uh, participation or civic engagement at local level. We somehow use um, the framework that we are also deploying at national level, which is very, uh, which is grounded in the uh, open budget survey at local level, because we are also doing this, this kind of assessment. So we're looking at three pillars in general, transparency, participation, and oversight when it comes to uh, assessing how open a budget or a, a fiscal process is. Uh, we are now working on several priorities. Uh, first of all, and probably the most important one, because we've been doing this for a long, long time and we're tired and we're sometimes even depressed or feel like we don't have an impact, is that we are now investing heavily in increasing the number of allies we have. So doing a lot of trainings with my colleagues to um, pre better prepare other CSOs as well as journalists to do the kind of monitoring work that we are doing when it comes to the budgets and procurement and geekish stuff like this. Uh, the second one, uh, the, the, the second priority we have right now is to pilot some collaborations with city halls for promoting open contracting. And right now we are working with uh, two municipalities, which are also run by mayors with, that are not really uh, the friends of the government, central government in power. But with one of them, we are focusing on open contracting, especially focused, uh, which is um, mostly uh, in the area. area environmental protection and the, uh, the other one is the Mishwara which is really close to Hungary uh, there will be a capital of culture uh, next year a European capital of culture and we're trying to convince them to open up all their spending for on this occasion another thing that we are now working on is building an uh, index of openness of the municipalities we have around 140 um, indicators that we are following and we're actually working with some of the partners uh, at the local level in order to this, do this assessment. Here you have one of the uh, the latest published uh, indexes because we are building the openness, uh, the, the index of openness of the municipalities on another index which is already at the second edition, a sort of an open budgets, open local budgets index and we are, and there we are assessing 109 municipalities in, in Romania. And this is a, uh, the 2022 uh, top and of course it makes us very popular with, uh, with mayors. Uh, let's see that they are scoring very well as you can imagine. Um, the good thing is that when it comes to scoring how open the local budgets are, we often find people making it good or decent from all political parties. Uh, so at least in this area, we don't seem very, very biased. Um, I was telling you about the fact that when we are looking at the budgets, we are looking at transparency, participation, and oversight. But um, 
as Edith has shown also in, in her keynote speech, we think that looking at the content of these budgets is key. Why? Because we started looking at budgets because we want to you know, empower citizens and tell them, hey, you can change things, you can promote projects for your community, you can make things better. But truth be told, if you go in depth and you look at the numbers, even the most progressive mayor in Romania doesn't have more than 10% that already looks, uh, sounds you know, extraordinary. But it, they have a very, very small amount of fiscal space to actually promote new projects. And what you want to do is first have a, a decent and objective overview of what is available and then promise and make uh, the local authorities deliver uh, this kind of a mechanism that involves citizens. Because otherwise, you'll get into that situation in which citizens are like, yes, let's participate in budgets, uh, budgets debate and so on, and in participatory budgeting processes. And guess what? Nothing will happen or too little will happen. So I think it is also up to us to set the expectations right and see where we're going with this. So in the project that we are um, conducting with our colleagues, we decided to focus on this um, territorial dimension of crisis. And basically, here's a, a map that I really, really like, and I know how many of you use the ESPON analysis. It's, uh, it's a thing of the, of the EU. They did some amazing research on the, on the impact of COVID at, uh, at local level from many points of view. Uh, but here is a map that I, I really, really like because it shows you uh, that this impact was, of course, disproportional and that it also has a strong financial dimension. And by the financial dimension, I mean the financial dimension on the budget, local budgets, as well as the financial dimension on the populations uh, that are living there. As you can see, this is the population at risk of poverty and how this, uh, this uh, map changed with COVID. Uh, I think you can, uh, your intuition is probably uh, telling you that, uh, of course, the most affected populations are those that were already at risk of poverty. Um, and what we're trying to see right now, and we were also built on um, uh, pre-existing research from the World Bank that also looked at how municipalities were responding to the COVID crisis and so on and so forth, is to see how the uh, budgets of hundred, the, the same 109 municipalities that we are assessing from this perspective of openness were dealing with the COVID uh, pandemic and now with the um, um, with the with the work. So what we did is we look. We, we actually gathered 109 budget executions from 2019 until 2022 September end of September 22, and we looked into the data and the evolutions of own revenues of um, the of the areas in which the expenditure has uh, has been uh, uh, growing or increasing and so on, because. Um, you know, I've uh, I've selected this this uh, this two graphics here because we we we've seen in Romania as well a tendency of decentralization, uh, the the central government uh, trying to gather more and more uh, power, more and more uh, money, and so on and so forth. But if you're looking at the data, at the aggregate data, it looks like Romania doesn't have an issue with the local government. So at the, at, the, at the level of the data, what you see here is that uh, with, the, with dark blue, you see uh, the revenues of the state budget, uh, and with, uh, with uh, an orange, you see the revenues of the local budgets. They're pretty much steady, right? And if you're uh, also looking at the, at the expenditure side, uh, what is happening there that is that the local budgets uh, are also rather rather steady. And what we, we asked ourselves, why is this happening? Well, the answer is somehow here. This is a program which is managed by the, the Ministry of Regional Development and Local Administration in Romania, which is highly clientelistic. And uh, the disbursements that they managed to do the, uh, through this program were actually acting like a cushion, especially since in 2019 and 2020, Romania experienced four rounds of elections. 
So what we did here is that we looked at the at the um, uh, at the cash flow and at the disbursements, and we where you see the peaks there, you actually have elections. <laughs> Um, and this is one of the possible explanations for why the revenues of the local governments have remained steady. However, this is the aggregate data, right? So if you're looking at the big number, it looks like we, we don't have a problem. The, the central government intervened and everything is fine. However, if you're uh, if you go into uh, uh, into more details, what you and, and I, I didn't put in here all the 109 municipalities that we analyzed. Uh, if you're looking at, uh, at this data, you see that the evolutions are somehow visible in the, in the structure of the revenues. So instead of having more own revenues available, most of these municipalities now have more subsidies uh, coming from the central government. Instead of them uh, spending more of the money for, I don't know, uh, investments, you see more of them spending on personnel. This, this is another thing. The government imposed a new uh, salaries uh, legislation for public sector, so they had, they were somehow forced to allocate most of the most of their money uh, on this. And when it comes to the capacity of these municipalities to access new uh, revenues, uh, new revenue streams such as the EU funds the classical EU funds, and now the recovery and resilience facility, what it happens is that you basically have almost no capacity for them to do so. Oh, they remain captured, uh, uh, captured by the central government. Thank you. So good morning, everyone. I'm Tomasz from Ujveni, uh, and I'm a junior lawyer. And Ujveni celebrated 25th birthday uh, this Monday, actually. So it was. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, so it was interesting for me to find out uh, uh, the vision uh, that the founding founding founders had uh, when they founded uh, our organization. They actually wanted to. Uh, create cycling trails and uh, enhance public space, uh, but they kept running into problems and these issues they quickly realized were connected to uh, to the corruption. So uh, the NGO changed its uh, its direction and in two following decades, uh, our uh, we <laughs> we started to uh, focus on uh, these topics. Uh, our work is uh, focused mainly on uh, local level and um, uh, we, have a, we have a legal clinic that uh, answers uh, somewhere between three and four hundred questions every year uh, to uh, active citizens and uh, local politicians. And uh, some of those more serious cases we take to the authorities and try to establish uh, case law. We also lobby for changes in uh, legislation, and uh, they are uh, this change. Uh, this uh, this is also usually picked up by our own research and analysis. For example, we use. Uh, uh, Z-Index, which is a tool that uh, that uh, is uh, that compares uh, public procurement in uh, municipalities and regions. Uh, we also teach local politicians and active citizens uh, how to transparently govern and uh, efficiently govern municipality and how to present transparency as a topic in uh, municipal in local election uh, campaigns. Uh, twice a year we have an anti-corruption uh, tour where, where we visit uh, municipalities and talk about and discuss their situations. Uh, there's also a starting program for teaching high school students. Uh, this month we opened a whistleblowing center which is one of our uh, topics here 
and we aim to uh, help whistleblowers uh, both lo uh, legally and psychologically and uh, we also hope to uh, help municipalities establish uh, robust and high quality uh, internal whistleblowing systems. As a lawyer, I spent most of my time working as, uh, for our legal clinic and uh, I uh, also argue for more progressive uh, whistleblowing legislation. I started to work at uh, Ojiveni one year ago and uh, by the time we were all already uh, well into a uh, COVID epidemic, uh, which meant that, uh, as you probably all also experienced, we uh, transferred to uh, work remotely, uh, mainly via uh, Microsoft Teams. Uh, we tried to, we had to move uh, our seminars and conferences to online space and uh, strengthen our communication uh, and visibility on social media. Uh, however, uh, we feel like the epidemic and uh, the and the following invasion of Ukraine uh, had a uh, had an impact on uh, <coughs> national media uh, uh, national media uh, interest in our activities, which we uh, face today. With the support of uh, National Endowment for Democracy and the uh, Car Monitor, uh, we conducted a study uh, which focuses on uh, municipality newspapers. Municipality newspapers are uh, newspapers that are published by the municipality and paid for by taxpayer money. And uh, these newspapers are delivered for free uh, to, to the citizens. Uh, the problem with these newspapers is that um, that uh, usually local governments use them as a free promotion tool and to critique uh, opposition. And so we rated uh, 50 uh, largest municipalities and their newspapers uh, and uh, pinpointed, uh, pointed out uh, the main reasons uh, why this happens and uh, we try to uh, find ways uh, to assist for systemic changes to make uh, uh, to make a change in the press law act so that the, so that the, um, so that the news, uh, local news, uh, local governments have uh, some uh, have <laughs> some uh, uh, sorry. Um, so uh, so that uh, there is a there is a clean line between uh, balanced newspaper and uh, and uh, what we see now, which is uh, which is a wrong situation. There is a there is a create uh, because the situation now creates the. Uh, uh, what we call uh, informational deserts, where uh, in some of, in some municipalities there's the only source of information is the is the local government. Uh, this is all from me. Uh, thank you for your uh, attention and well. Thank you. Hello, my name is Szymon Dubiela and I'm from Sieć Obywatelska Łożda Polska, so Citizen Network Łożda Poland. Uh, and I'd like to uh, tell you about our uh, project, but first of all, about Sieć itself. We were founded in 2003, so we we're slightly younger than the beginning few years. And our main topic, main focus is the right to information, we believe that this is the right information as a human rights serve as sort of a, a basis for political rights because without information there is no meaningful political activity from citizens and, and, and we believe that this is like a, a first line of defense against any kind of state abuse uh, of power and it's especially important in a time of crisis like Eric mentioned. So Ukraine crisis, energy crisis, and of course, 
COVID pandemic. This is our team, and I'm also present in this photo because, uh, regrettably, the, our best picture is Rivaku, so uh, yeah, that's how it is. Uh, and what do we do to protect right to information? Our one of the most important activities is uh, legal counseling, uh, similar to Ozhevieni. We have about 100 and uh, 1,200 cases a year. Uh, we, be, we help with right to information and local government issues in general. So every time a citizen requests information and doesn't get an answer, gets a no or is ignored, we help uh, and we advise what to do uh, in such a situation. We also conduct civic education via meetings, via webinars in entire Poland so that uh, we help people know their rights and kind of encourage them to use them, to exercise those rights. Uh, we also conduct this kind of everyday civic oversight, which is basically every time there's some public debate, there's some big news, big story, we request information about things we talk about. So a discussion can be based on the facts of what we know. So I think the last uh, request we sent just before I left for Budapest was about uh, investment of nuclear power plant that's supposed to be uh, in Poland. At least that's what they promised. And uh, we'll see if, they, uh, if Ministry of uh, Public Assets will give us information. They probably won't because uh, that's what they do. Uh, and if they don't, we litigate court cases and we have lots of them. We also help our clients uh, when not in not every case, but when we think that it's important for uh, right to information in general, we joined, uh, joined such a cases. Uh, we also conduct more broad uh, oversight. Uh, we, we call it monitoring. I don't know if that's a right term, but we basically pick a topic and try to ask as many appropriate institutions as possible. So, for example, uh, it was 2016, we uh, checked transparency of financial awards for public officials. We asked 66 uh, big cities in Poland. Uh, we gather the information, we analyze it, and we report on that. We publish what, uh, what we get. We also asked uh, forest inspectorates about sale of wood a few years ago. And for some reason, it was like the most secret information you could get. We met uh, incredible uh, resistance. And, and basically, every year, we get a few uh, monitoring uh, like, like that. And about our current project, uh, promoting local government accountability is why we are uh, here. And basically, I will talk more about that uh, later, but we focus on commune council settings and uh, access to those settings, which uh, went downwards during, during the pandemic. Uh, another uh, project is uh, Freedom of Information Recovery uh, Action. And both of those are done with support of National Endowment for Democracy. And uh, Recovery Action is more about broader, identifying broader problems uh, with right to information. And uh, we have lots of experience with that, and we try to kind of transform this experience into a possible solution uh, of those problems. And to more uh, local level, connected strictly to local government, uh, which means hopelessness of small and big uh, community, is civic training course for local officials and people in general interested in uh, their community. It's about local government law, about ethics of that law, and how to basically effectively function in such an uh, environment. And this is how it looked in 2021 when we went online. Uh, Szkoła Inicjatyw Strażniczych or Warsdog School is similar to hopelessness of small big community. The difference is that it's aimed at watchdogs, so not uh, for public officials, but rather people who are interested in exercising this kind of uh, civic oversight. Uh, and another, uh, our project is civic data mining, where we basically set up two uh, interconnected digital platforms and every time we do some monitoring, like the ones I mentioned earlier, we uh, request information, and usually there are literally hundreds of requests we uh, 
uh, we sent. So we put the answers on uh, federmanie.sieciobywatelska.pl for everyone to see, and uh, we analyze it on sprawdzamyjakjest.pl, and it's open for everyone to participate, and everyone can see what answers we got, and they help us analyze them. And that was uh, Wozniak's in 2022. Uh, and, about, uh, and about me in all of this, I'm my most, uh, my biggest part of my working uh, watchdog is legal consulting. So uh, when we have those 1200 cases a year, I answer a big chunk of them. Uh, I provide text and articles for our websites, and I'm involved in promoting local government accountability and freedom of information recovery action projects. I've been involved with Watchdog since 2016, so it's basically my whole adult life, so <laughs> I don't know how to do anything else. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and uh, I'm going to tell you about uh, promoting local government accountability project. Uh, for some background, we uh, focused on common city councils and how access to them was distributed during the uh, pandemic. Basically, in spring of 2020, that was, well, there was time of panic and it manifested in Poland in a form of legal chaos. We used to joke that we had, had a law of press conferences. And basically, Prime Minister would set a press conference and said that there is some new law, but it wasn't reflected anywhere else. And then there would be another press conference that would correct that and so on and so on. So it was a time of legal chaos and people were scared. People in uh, Communal councils were scared and they would start to restrict access to sittings without legal basis or with dubious ones like uh, executive acts, not uh, acts of law. Uh, when the proper law arrived, there were problems with constitutional law. If you can restrict freedom of movement without declaring state of emergency as described in constitutions, because our government basically uh, used a normal a normal bill when they created something that was called a state of epidemic and state of epidemic emergency, which still uh, is in force in Poland. Today it was uh, prolonged till the end of December. It will probably be prolonged even uh, longer into the, uh, the future. All of these problems kind of trickled to local communities and there was a plethora of solution to those problems because uh, chairmen of those councils basically didn't know what to do. They had little direction, little guidance, so every co commune had different practice, almost. And we immediately noticed a problem because of our legal counseling, because people were asking us that they wanted to visit uh, their uh, commune council when there was a sitting, and they were denied uh, if it was legal and what they could do. So we basically uh, did an analysis of this problem of legal acts. Uh, we analyzed media reports about the most egregious uh, examples of denial of uh, entrance or access uh, uh, to the sittings. We talked to uh, local government officials, we talked to activists, we talked to normal people who were interested in, uh, yeah, I know, I know, uh, in this issue. And we end up with building a set of recommendations. Those recommendations were aimed both our lawmakers, because we concluded that the law in Poland currently is uh, insufficient regarding the uh, situation, and to local uh, officials how they can make cities more accessible right now, even with no changes in law. Uh, we, uh, made a, we organized a workshop on 25th of July with activists, with local officials from a Polish Counties Association, with Association of Rural Communities, when we basically confronted them with our recommendations, what do they think about it, to criticize them, to uh, debate about them. And right now we are in process of gathering feedback, of uh, improving and uh, revising our recommendations so we can provide another workshop and uh, hopefully lobby for uh, implementing them in real life uh, in the future. And that's all for me. Thank you for your attention.
Okay, thank you all. Um, these were all amazing um, projects and activities, and I always feel privileged to be part of this Eastern, Central Eastern European civil society community doing so many uh, great things. Um, I would uh, open up the floor now for questions, and this also goes for edit. Um, so um, please join. Um, obviously, we're uh, a bit behind time, so those who feel uh, like they must have a coffee or a, or a juice now, feel free to quickly jump to the back. Um, um, but So we'll have a shorter coffee break, and we might take a few minutes from the next panel, but I think it's good to, to have some discussions about um, these activities and, and the situation how um, different countries um, um, and, and partners deal with it. So if you have any uh, questions, thoughts, uh, ideas coming up, please let us know. And i hand over the mic to Anna. So I would like to ask you about the resources in your organizations versus priorities. Uh, how did it look like? Um, when the crisis hit and uh, the, the first crisis and then the next crisis, um, was it easy or was it a challenge to work with the resources that you that you had uh, and pivot or maybe not? I can imagine what Shimon uh, was saying about noticing that there is a pattern in uh, in questions, and then you already had other uh, other cases happening, and I am wondering what was extended: money, people, um, hours. What what happened when it comes to the workload in organizations when that happened? Uh, well, in our case, I think it was mostly the people's and oh, sorry, uh, people and uh, hours because uh, analyzing the legal law is uh, for me it's mostly a question of uh, of time and in, increase the. Can you hear me when I yeah, speak without? I think so. Yeah. Okay, so I, yeah, I'm just turning off. Okay, uh, so it was a matter for of workload of people and uh, of time. Like we try, the thing we do, like Sprawdzamiakis or Federvania, is kind of aimed at at the future, so we can build uh, like this community based tool to analyze uh, information. Because uh, in our work, we mostly do uh, we send requests, and we, and there are over uh, 1,500 communes in Poland. So for our team, it's kind of impossible to count it or to analyze it, uh, like, you know, by hand, manual or, or whatever. Uh, so we work to build tools that will help us uh, with the uh, workload. But when it comes to this project, it was, uh, as I said, uh, people, uh, people and hours, uh, because it's, just took time and effort to analyze all of that and kind of put it into into perspective or some model. Thank you. Yeah. Others comments on this? Maybe I can jump in as well. I think we were fortunate to have some uh, uh, funding that was quite flexible, and I think that the the COVID nineteen pandemic was probably the first time when the donors were very easy to persuade because they were experiencing that themselves mm -hmm. and it was much easier to persuade that you know <laughs> there's something happened we should reallocate or rethink a bit some of the things that we are doing but i think that there, there is another um uh, trend that is worth noting what happened with regards to especially areas like uh, emergency procurement or um uh, I don't know, vulnerable populations uh, support and so on, was that urgent 
emergency um, funding was made available in many cases. And I think that a lot of, at least in the case of Romania, our organizations and others couldn't help themselves and were like, of course we were going to do something, right? And look, there's also money available for this. It sounds like easy peasy. And the result was that we ended up doing significantly more work, at least in, in the first part of the pandemic, with some resources, but the, the load on the, on the team was significantly higher. And the same happened now with Ukraine, because everybody was like, how, how could I stay aside? Now this time the mic, Weber. Sure. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Nicola von Gong, uh, and uh, thank you to all the contributors. Many of the things you touched upon echo uh, uh, strongly in our Croatian experience as well. Uh, three quick questions. Firstly, uh, uh, primarily, um, uh, the, the decentralization model, Polish, which you refer to, which is often considered a in European terms, an example of good practice. I mean, I'm interested. You said that there were uh, that there were initiatives from the central government to dissolve it, but you mentioned also that the president was the main actor who who vetoed it. I'm interested. How entrenched is this model among the PIS voters? I mean, how, would there be? Uh, I, I don't know if there was some polling or your assessment. Would there be a significant political price? For the government to basically, if the government really went through this uh, 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 this recentral, radical recentralization uh, in Poland, so that's your thoughts on that. Just a brief clarification: you mentioned the LGBTQ card. Uh, I'm not familiar with this mechanism. Just clarification: how does it work? And thirdly, basically, some thoughts from all of you. I mean. Uh, uh, with respect to these local governments, which are essentially, uh, which are essentially, you know, uh, counter, counter populist and stuff. I mean, does it, does it necessarily equate to reformists? I mean, do they basically? How do they? Especially in terms of the fiscal pressure that they are experiencing now. I, I can refer to, for instance, Croatian experience, where you have an administration in the city of Zagreb, which in order to, which went about uh, redistribution. And of course, that's that's a painful stuff. I mean, they they, they, they open many fronts and, uh, and, uh, and, and created a very strong opposition in going into the, uh, in cutting into the entitlements, in uh, uh, trying to organize uh, waste management in a more, uh, 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 more effective way. Um, in, uh, um, um, in in some of the, in, in in numerous elements which touch upon a very strong clientelistic basis, okay. And then on the other hand, you have also uh, a, a new independent local government in the city of Pula. I'm sorry, Romanians. It is it is called Pula. It's the name of the city. And <laughs> we're gonna explain this in the conversation. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, when they went, the, the, when they went about the problem with uh, basically monetizing public infrastructure. So, how are your experience and what is the level of diversity on, on their approaches of these local governments to this fiscal crisis? Thank you. And sorry for taking up a little more time. Thank you. Edit, you want to start? Okay. If you yeah. the mic doesn't work, just turn it off. Okay, it looks like it works for me at least. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so uh, okay, so um, these are both great questions. I'm I'm gonna jump on the, the two that you raised first. Um, this is a good one about the public sentiments, and I'm a little bit skeptic whether that would um, significantly turn over and would create some sort of tension between the core electorate of PIS and and uh, uh, and the party. And I'll tell you why, because the whole idea of undercutting any kind of checks and balances and counter effects, you know, or something which would constrain the central government was based on the very idea of checks and balances are Western impositions which are like a lot of troublesome. I mean, it makes a lot of difficulties in our life. It makes us central government to 
to govern efficiently, to get things done for the people. So it nicely fits into this populistic idea of us versus them and what works, what not, with our help. Um, so I think that was something with which we uh, we were witnessing it with the, the judiciary rule. There were also some bad sentiments towards that, but it didn't eventually turn conservative electorate against the party because they said like, yeah, well, you know, they just try to make things easier for us. So, you know, trying to reallocate uh, competencies to the central government would probably wouldn't be that much like, but they wouldn't feel like this is something which is like against their, you know, will of the people type of thing. Um, so I think I think that's, uh, but this is certainly something would be worth measuring, like uh, how, how would people react to that, but I'm a little bit skeptic whether it would make any political implication on, you know, electoral success of the party or not. Um, about LGBTQ card, as far as I remember, this was something which was provided by the, the city of Warsaw to show on first on the first hand to show support symbolically to sexual minorities that this is an open city we're taking care of you we're providing you with for instance uh, shelters when it's needed because there were a lot of issues with people who have been um, you know being rejected by their families at the end of the day because they came out as you know sexual minorities um, and the cultural environment was just simply like overall was not really ready for uh, for that. I mean, I think Warsaw is a bubble, but this is exactly why it had to also come up with countermeasures which are a little, little bit like bubbleish. So on one hand, symbolic uh, support. On the other hand, I think there were some services which were provided with, you know, these sexual minorities. Um, but you don't have to imagine it like as robust as as I don't know, right now they're not providing the initiatives of so that they can get married or so there are no, we, we haven't gotten that that far so far. And it's also, I think, because uh, I think the city leadership is quite brave in this regard, but they're not suicidal. So they don't want to go as much against the central initiatives, which are as you know homophobic as it gets uh, that much. But maybe Shimon can tell me more a little bit about that. Okay. Yeah, to just uh, two quick uh, things, uh, especially about your first question about this, uh, about local government. Uh, first, uh, local government in Poland generally has high public trust, much higher than parliament, much higher than judges. And I don't know if there are any pollings about uh, electorates, so I don't know if uh, ruling coalition electorate is higher or lower, but I think that there's certainly a risk for them to kind of try to uh, openly attack uh, local government as a whole, because from uh, my perspective, my experience, they don't do it in necessarily overt way. They are like present this narrative, and we support local government, we will give you money, those funds, and they kind of, uh, well, not secretly, they're doing, they know what they're doing, and they know that their actions will result in, uh, you know, well, not destruction, but limiting autonomy of this local government, but I wouldn't, I don't think personally that there is like this political game in uh, openly saying that, yeah, we don't like local government and we want to dismantle it. So, my perspective. Maybe just one more thought on that. Um, so, we also have to see that their kind of initiative was also not that robust. What they were trying to do, it's not comparable to what we witnessed in Hungary, is that the government came up with the idea to impose a local financial audit on the level of the local governments, the governance, so that they're going to you know, impose some control financially, but it wasn't like completely hollowing it out of any autonomies or space to maneuver economically, for instance. I think that's also an important difference between Hungary and Poland. Okay, uh, just briefly on your question of how reformist uh, local governments can be. Uh, I'm going to share some of my personal experience having been part of local uh, Budapest district local government for the past two and a half years. Um, so the general answer is that I don't think that they are very reformists. Um, a lot depends, unfortunately, on the personal priorities of the mayor, I think, and how uh, and the vision of the mayor and what they can uh, push through uh, a city council. Uh, also, these progressive uh, measure, progressive and often participatory measures, I think, touch more on the fringes of local policies and don't necessarily affect um, policies where uh, 
substantial money or assets are involved. So, for example, I haven't seen that uh, contracting uh, practices change a lot or asset management. I think that is also why, why um, looking at asset management practices is very important. And to just say, um, tell you about one specific example of uh, when such a policy was uh, uh, changed due to public pressure um, in my district was when uh, a little bit of background, just a tiny bit of background, uh, before 2022 elections, the opposition parties held primaries. So that was actually internal political uh, com uh, competition within the, among the, the opposition parties. And our city council tried to sell a very valuable plot downtown, uh, which was still mostly green. So uh, local communities came together to protect uh, that plot. And I don't think they would have succeeded uh, if they had, hadn't been a competition and it happened in the three to four months before the pri uh, primary, elec uh, primary? Is that it? Yeah, primary elections of the opposition parties. And I think that was really interesting to see how that affected the internal workings. And when one party backed out of uh, the liquidation of that plot, then all the others suddenly followed, like, oh, no, no, we never wanted to sell it. It was a previous uh, local government who actually had the idea. We had no idea what was going on. Mm, I would add something on the reformist versus um, conservative, <laughs> actually, <laughs> which is rather strange. I think that some of these mayors are trying to be reformist, but it depends what reformist means. Um, a brief example that I could share with you is related to the use of EU funds from the RRF, from the Recovery Resilience Facility. Um, most of the municipalities in Romania want to access these funds just to go into this renovation wave component, which means that the buildings would be um, made more energy efficient, right? So this is very, you know, it's an important intervention, but it's not like wow, <laughs> we've innovated something here, it, we've renovated, right? Um, and you have some mayors that would like to, for example, implement uh, green procurement. And those are actually from coming from these cities where there is more of a hipsterish uh, kind of a feeling, their electorate is more progressive in itself because that's why they got elected in the first place. Um, and there you actually see some not necessarily resistance from the central government, but rather, a, oh my God, look at these guys, they are talking about such small things and such unimportant things while we have important issues to deal with. So for me right now, it's important to at least have them um, like in medicine, you know, first do no harm. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's my bottom line and my minimum standard. And then if they can, you know, reform a bit, that's also fine. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, I cannot speak as for the general, uh, for, uh, if, if the no, new local governments are reformists, but what we see with the ones with, that we work with is that uh, after usually taking power after 20 years of uh, one party in a, in a set municipality, uh, almost any action is reformist because, uh, <laughs> and, and uh, I mean, uh, there are ways uh, such as in uh, public procurement uh, that, uh, that are new. Uh, there's, for example, a dynamic system that allows you, uh, allows the municipality to uh, to uh, really uh, make, it, make, make it more transparent and uh, more achievable for smaller uh, smaller companies to, to uh, attend. Uh, and I think that's just one of many examples of what, what, what a new, new ruling party can do. Thank you. Okay, very brief. This <laughs> to it, maybe to it. Yeah, uh, thank you, you so much. You can both after each other and then yeah, this. Uh, thank you so much for your presentations.
I actually wanted to ask, my name is Ingrida from Transparency International Lithuania. I wanted to ask how you discuss uh, in your teams what does success mean to you and your organization and how do you measure it, especially wow. in times of We can open crisis. a session for them. <laughs> 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 okay, uh, maybe my, my question is more more easier. <laughs> um, Ishvan, I, I'd love to, um, if, if you could uh, switch back in, in to your map, the slide with, with the map, uh, I'd like to ask you for a closer look because there are some municipalities, uh, a lot of municipalities so somehow affected by uh, energy crisis. And uh, I, I'd love to ask, uh, what does it mean? <laughs> yeah, that's it. I think um, you might be able to answer some of it, but depending on the scope of your question, like my colleague, Mikulosh is probably a better person. Uh, all, all I need is just the legend. <laughs> oh, just the legend. Oh, oh yeah. Let me show you in the break. Okay. I, I, I will show it in the break. Okay, okay. okay. Most so, of, I think yellow is, is uh, <laughs> anyway, it helps. Okay, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, and to Ingrida's question on um, the, the evaluation, any thoughts? I know you're very strict with that, Elena. You want to say <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and I have to go to one of my colleagues because he did something wrong. <laughs> Now, uh, for example, when I did the index of the openness of budgets, for me, success was that uh, a mayor's uh, advisor wrote to us a mail, uh, an email that said, well, we scored under five points here. It's a shame. And there was no but afterwards. He was like, can we discuss about how to improve this? And there is success from him because and it means that the instrument in itself, so the index, was well built, not perfect, but well built, because it became an effect, effective advocacy uh, instrument as well, and it opened the dialogue between us and the local authority, right? Because they knew they had to check at least some uh, some boxes, and that they they knew that they have to reach out to us. So uh, I'm working with, in my NGO for one year, so uh, you would have probably have to ask my boss about what success is. But um, uh, I feel I feel like uh, there are successes such as uh, us uh, helping local politicians, and they they then or active citizens, and then they uh, winning local elections and uh, applying our uh, methods or uh, what we teach and. Uh, but uh, also uh, implementing, like uh, changing, uh, trying, uh, achieving uh, changing legislation uh, in Czech Republic. Uh, but uh, I think what uh, where where we are not very successful, as I touched on this topic in the presentation, is uh, ha uh, having uh, our. Uh, uh, Having our achievements heard by uh, the general public, and uh, for example, the, uh, the the comparison of the local newspapers uh, was not very uh, uh, publicly discussed. Discussed topic uh, after we uh, published it. So. Thank you. Uh, well, in our case, I think. Uh, it's much easier to measure success in each individual case. When you request information and you got the information, that's the success. Uh, like on the more uh, sophisticated way to look at it, it's a success when we get it immediately because we often end up in a situation when you request for something, then we have a court case because they say no and we get the information after two years when it's uh, outdated. And on the more uh, scale of our goals in general, uh, that's complicated because uh, I think that right now one of the biggest problems for transparency point is the way courts interpret the, uh, the law. Because I think that uh, our law regarding access to information is quite good, but it was made bad in, uh, in courts. Uh, and that's something that... Uh, <laughs> uh, 
uh, I think that the problem on this highest level is that it's something that takes years to measure. And even if we change though, for example, we will not know uh, how successful that change uh, so that change was. So I think that um, success on individual cases is when we get information and uh, I, and I don't know uh, how to measure success really on those grand scale. Uh, I think the only thing we can do is like look at the decades, like from 2000 uh, to 2010 it was better and now it's worse, but this is something that you can know after the fact, I think. I, I don't know if there's uh, like, you know, uh, foolproof immediate method of measuring in, in this regard.